I have been. Hi, my yep. name is Ray Canterbury. I'm going to be hosting Arch Talk 101. And we have a special guest on the line with us, uh, Jeremy. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little something uh, about yourself. All right. My name is Jeremy Lofton. I'm from Georgia, born and raised, uh, just turned 51. Uh, father, I got two boys and a daughter and two stepkids, married, and um, I help manage a construction company. To be quick, that's the, my brief get to know me. And uh, my passion is uh, love chasing big bucks with archery equipment. Yeah, you, you said you have a construction company. What's the name of it? And how would they get a hold of you if they want something done? And what, what is it you do with it? It's uh, Big House Construction. We're out of Woodstock. Um, my cell is 404-390-9507. And we take care of anything but modeling-wise, uh, storm damage insurance, roofing. We are a turnkey, full-service construction company. Well, I, that keeps you busy. <laughs> keeps me slammed. It's hard to find time to hunt. But always during November is my, my golden time. That's when I take my time off. I save all my sick days and vacation days to the magical rut. That, that's what I used to do. It's like my vacation is going on a hunting trip or, or something, you know, I, just to go someplace to just do stuff. It just never really interests me. It's like, I got to have something to do when I get there. You know, right. I go sitting on the beach, just sitting there. It's like, I get bored. Get right. You know, going to hunt, that's ideal vacation for me. I base my time off, uh, what's the weather, what's, you know, what's going on with the weather, and I take time off. Well, luckily, I, I hunt a lot of suburban areas, so I'm actually fortunate to be able to take off mornings, hunt mornings. I hunt real close to the house. I don't really travel far. I don't I don't hunt any hunting clubs, so um, majority of my hunting is uh, close quarters, anywhere from three to five acres. Uh, I got a couple you know, spots 10, 15 acres. Uh, my biggest spot's 20 acres. Uh, but it's, it's mainly archery. And that's uh, so all I do is archery hunt and uh, knock doors, get permission, and branch out people I know to obtain permission to chase these, you know, these elusive suburban big bucks. You know, what, what state do you live in? I live in Georgia. Georgia. Okay. I think you said I just, I missed it. <laughs> I live about an hour uh, north of Atlanta. Uh, okay. Little town called Dallas, Georgia, and uh, but you know I'm lucky enough that uh, I'm always out in one of my top spots is actually from a client of mine that I did some remodeling for. I was doing some remodeling. I was like, man, these look like some really good woods, and he started telling me about all these deer. So what the day I was there, I looked outside and I seen a, you know a 125, 130, and I was like, man, this place is awesome. He said, uh, yeah, you're welcome to hunt here, all you want. And that's actually where I took my largest buck last year. Oh, cool. So, Yes, so it, it worked out to gain these spots like that. But it's getting really tough now. Uh, competition, we got a lot of guys uh, doing the suburban thing around here, and uh, you know, gaining land under permission is it's getting tougher and tougher for us guys. You know, a lot of door knocking, we get more door slammed on us than yeses. Yeah, so. and and sometimes you know, it's it's not as much that you know they're giving you permission. It's like, what can you do for them? Right. And, right. You know, if you go in that approach, it's like, hey, you know, like you have a construction company. It's like, okay, what do you need done? You know, I'm right. a piece of land. I can give you a good deal on it. I offer that land. all the time. That's yeah. how I get my foot in the door. It's like, hey, I don't mind doing something at cost or doing something free. If I, you know, if I, if I think a place is really, really good, then yes, um, that's an option for me. Yeah. You buy the materials and I'll do the work. And you know, Correct. Yeah, so I'm saying, you know, here, you know, being an archery instructor is like, hey, you're in archery. You know what? Hey, let me hunt your property with you. And, you know, I'm going to make you a better archer. I've right. Done many times. And, you know, there's probably not too many archers that I couldn't help somewhat. Mm -hmm. Even even the archers that are, you know, been shooting for a while. Mm -hmm. you know, I had I one guy sent me a video and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking, it's like, try this i finally found something that we could maybe tweak you know right. to make that little extra one you know in the beginner like there's so many things to fix <laughs> right see lucky for me i grew up shooting terminal archery uh shot 3d i shot light indoor i travel around asa ibo uh, i was actually one of the first staffs 
for a lot of different bow companies back in, you know, 18, 19 years old. That's been, you know, over 30 years ago that I actually got started. This is before archery was even a, a thing, a big thing. I mean, so I was kind of a pioneer. The only reason I had to stop is, you know, family, businesses, stuff like that. I just really didn't have the time to devote for it. These guys that are competitive, that's all they do. For the working class guy, it's just hard to devote all your time, you know, for that lifestyle. But I still shoot, you know, a good bit. Um, I'm always playing with my equipment. I do my own bow tuning, and uh, I'm always tinkering with my equipment. And, you know, I'm real OCD on my archery stuff. So, yeah. but. I, I do a lot of practice, so being a bow only. So, but I do hunt some areas that people do gun hunt. Uh, that's a big challenge, but you know, I've never had a problem or issue with it. So, my largest buck to date in Georgia is uh, 174. Some change. I killed him in 2016. That's my largest. And to date, I think I've got 16 poping yokes. So, that that's that's an accomplishment. Yeah. Yes, sir. And the crazy thing is, yeah, the crazy thing is, I've never killed a big deer with my gun. Back when I grew up gun hunting with my family and my father and uncles and cousins, I've never ever taken a deer over 115 with a rifle growing up. I didn't start taking my big deer until I started hunting tight quarter uh, suburban areas, you know, closer to the town. Um, with that's they get no pressure, so that's kind of been my you know my go to. Yeah, as you know, close to town, they're not going to let you shoot a firearm. Correct. Correct. You know, just, just too, too much risk in, in you know that bullet going way further. Because you know the bullet's not going to stop in the no. it's going to go through. Yeah. And it, you know, once you shoot, you can't call it back. So, but my number one areas are you know we got actually uh, counties here in Georgia that are archery only. So uh, my number one county is Fulton and Cobb, and luckily the state has those archery only. Those two counties grow the biggest deer in the state every year after year after year. So. But you don't have the pressure of the firearm season, and no, sir. You're gonna, my largest, you're gonna a lot of them gone that way. But my largest buck was actually killed in a gun county, believe it or not. <laughs> so it goes both ways. Yeah, yeah, it goes both ways. Uh, but fortunate enough that uh, I've gotten, you know, my I got family has a little bit of acreage, and so just being able to chase these big deer has just been a passion of my, of my life. It's just, I mean, I kill one deer a year. Some years I don't harvest a deer. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm all about QDMA, you know, I only chase the, I do the, you know, I only chase the mature deer. And uh, so if I don't kill deer, I'm, I'm great with it. So it's not about the kill for me. No more. It's all yeah. about the chase. When you get, get a good area where, you know, the chances of, of getting one, if you want meat, you got meat, you know, right. you can wait. I know here in Nebraska, right. that when I first started, there was only two permits. And mm -hmm. I got where I would shoot the first year that come by and then I'd only hunt bucks until, you know, yeah. until December time. Because our, our archery season at that time was September 15th through December 31st, except for the nine days and, you know, the second week of November that rifle was there. Then we shut down during that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, come December, I would, you know, fill my tag just so I could fill my tag. Right. But, so I grew up and it was three bucks, two dollars growing up. And then now it's... Uh, 10 does and two bucks now. So, the, you know, the state's got more liberal on their doe tags. Yeah. Yeah. Now in Nebraska, they've got their season choice tag. They've had that for a while where you, you can get, um, you know, therefore it was two, two does or two antlerless deer because they don't say does, mm -hmm. two antlerless right. deers, antlerless. Um, you know, on a tag and you can get how many tags you want. I know when I had my store, I had guys come in, legally shoot 20 some deer. Yeah. And, <laughs> That's a lot. I would want to process it because I process my own because I, I want to make sure I have my meat. I want to get my meat back and I want to make sure it's cut the way, you know, mm -hmm. my family and I, we use it. And, Correct. You know, and much, much better way to do it. And, and you know, the way I got it, I use the uh, the plastic wrap from, um, you know, the butchers use very mm -hmm. thick stuff, not the saran wrap that you see. It's really thin. And then. And then I double, I wrap it with that, get all the air out of it, and double wrap it with uh, uh, the butcher paper. And, you know, I did a moose that way. And five years later, I'm pulling meat out of the bottom of the freezer and it's still good. Still. Because it doesn't go through the thaw, thaw cycle in a freezer. Yes. You know, where yeah. the refrigerator does and it destroys the, the meat after right. six months or so. 
my family, uh, they love being jerky. So that's our, our top thing we do with them. Uh, I make jerky with most of mine, and I, and I get some of the ground up. So ground and jerky is a big thing for my family. So Yeah, yeah I remember one year I had, uh, you know, freezer was all full. Mm. I got another deer. And it's like, I can't put it in the freezer. It's full. There's no place for it. So I kind of started making jerky out of it. And that deer lasted about two weeks. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? Yeah. I'll bring it to my work and give it to my guys. And it doesn't last long. So now um, my kids are eating as soon as it was got done and stick another batch in. And then, and then, uh, you know, that, that'd be done and that they'd, they'd be gone by the time the next batch in there. And yeah, about two weeks, the whole deer was gone. <laughs> yeah. So like my house. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 so much better meat for you than you know than you know the commercial raised meat you know, mm -hmm. have chemicals in it and you know deer don't have none of that and that's no you want organic meat <laughs> it's the best. animals it's the best trust me it's the best uh i got a local processor that does all my um sometimes i'll get sausage made solid corn usually if i kill a mature deer uh, with your buck um, yeah I usually, I usually grind it and then if we kill a couple of does or something, we'll turkey those. So luckily I got I got two sons at home. So they're more sugar happy now than I am. Oh <laughs> it's no problem uh <laughs> having a shortage of deer meat at my house. Because you know they're still they're younger and uh they're 26 and 23, so they're still trigger happy. Yeah, so. yeah, they're they're young enough, they're they're still excited about it. And oh yeah. When you've done it for a while, you're not quite as excited about it, but it's still you know a, a lot of a lot of fun going out and if i'm it. if i'm dragging out and doing a lot of work it's got to be worth it. it's got to be worth it <laughs> yeah it's really worth it. you want to drag out the little ones <laughs> right right it's, it's a lot of work you know once you hear the ground people don't understand how much work it actually is there goes your day you know yeah because you know now the bigger ones are harder to pull out but Correct. that's why they have carts nowadays right put them that's on a cart and wheel them out <laughs> That's one investment I need to get because uh, I got a couple spots that are just thick. And uh, luckily, I got two healthy, strong boys to help me drag. So it's, that's not a problem to help that out. I've, I've drug a lot of deer. You know, me and a hunting partner would I, drag a lot I, of deer. Each, each grab a I, leg and pull, you know. <laughs> I, I've grown up dragging deer. So, you know, I've, I've deer hunted all my life. I think I took my first deer with a gun when I was 11 years old uh, down in South Georgia, Calhoun Spike. So um, I started deer hunting around these parts uh, when I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old. Going home, my dad, deer were scarce. Uh, you hunt all year, you may see one deer, and it was just you know. But we still hunted, and then we got in a club down in South Georgia, and it was still nothing like today. I mean, you would hunt all weekend, maybe see a deer, and you know we count the days down to doe days. It was like a big deal. Oh my gosh. In two weeks, there's a doe day. We better be taking off work and hunting all the doe days just to go down there to be able to shoot a doe. It was a big yeah. deal, a lot bigger deal uh, back then than it is now. So, and now the deer populations is just is it, skyrocketing. Well, yeah, I don't say you can take ten does. <laughs> yeah, ten does what I got now, and then uh, you know all our WMAs or they, they tag them for you. So I mean, if you was to hunt the WMAs plus what the state tags get you, I mean. So they're telling them you could actually legally harvest in one year. So, and that's a lot of good meat. Correct. Correct. And if it's more yeah. than what your family can use, you can always give some away. Yeah. So we have a lot of donation uh, feed the hungry stuff here too. So uh, we got a couple of programs that are up and running to, the, to donate to deer your kills. So it's not a problem finding needy families that need it. It never goes to waste. So I, you you always have friends come deer season. You got any extra deer meat? That's a that's a given every year. Yeah, and some uh, of us say, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll give you a call when I get one down. You can help help me drag it out. You call them, I was like, oh no, I'm busy. But can I nobody help? But they'll they'll ride over with a cooler. Yeah. So oh, go, no, no, it's it's not out yet. I got to get it. I got to cut it up and. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. come help me, and uh, yeah, you can have some, but. Correct. But a good thing about some of these spurvis spots, you know, you don't got too much land to, to deal with. Uh, you know, my, one of my best spots is in Milton, it's in Fulton County, and it's only like 15 acres. And luckily, it's pretty accessible, but it's, it's really thick, but it's pretty accessible over the truck. So it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, we've had some 
a uh, buddy of mine shot one and it run out of the forest. It was it was an area where they camp, you know, it's one of the giving mm -hmm. parks on the land. And it run out and there happened to be a dump station, you know, where the campers go dump. Mm -hmm. It died about three or four feet from the asphalt. Really? He drove up, loaded it up. <laughs> you know, yeah, got right up to it. I got a similar story. I was hunting a small piece of property and uh, I could see the food plot from where I parked at the guy's house. The guy had uh, like 25 acres and it was midday, like two o'clock. And I got there and I was getting ready for my hunt. And I stepped out, stepped out of my truck, looked at my food plot, and there was uh, the buck I've been chasing for two years, haven't seen in daylight, was with a doe in my food plot 60 yards away. <laughs> so I grabbed my leafy suit, put on a quick stalk. And stock within 40 yards of him. And when I shot him, uh, he ran and fell 20 feet from my truck where I was parked at the driveway. <laughs> so I've got one of those stories too. Yeah, quick, yeah. quick kill, quick drag. I mean, I really thought he was running jumping back in the truck. So it was one of those good hunts. But that was one of the deers that was, uh, one, I, hunted, I chased that deer for years and years and years, but never was seen in daylight. So, but two o'clock one day, it all happened. Come out, come out one time, and that was it. I had him on my camera, but he would always disappear. Uh, he would always show back up around November, and he would stay around two, three weeks. And I'd get mostly night pictures, a couple day pictures, but he would disappear, and we'd never see him again. I always thought, you know, he was real noticeable. Uh, you could identify him easy because he had a split G two on his right side and made him out for it. And ever since he was four and a half, I started getting pictures of him. He had that one G2 split, and that's how I always could recognize him. And he finally messed up, you know. I mean, I chased that deer for years. So that was actually one of the oldest deers I've actually had a chance to harvest. So, and everybody around me said, yes, that deer's been around here for years and years and years. And same thing, all the hunters. He would not, never show up. You know, you get a couple pictures, dis he would disappear. So that lead to tell me that he had a... a he had a different range and then, you know, during the rut, he traveled because the guy I talked to was like a mile, over a mile away. It was getting pictures of him too. He's like, gosh, just here, you know, drove me nuts. You know, he showed me pictures, we compared pictures and confirmed it was the same deer. So they, they travel a big area, don't they? They do. They did. You know, I've heard stories of, you know, each night they all collar deer, how they travel, you know, four or five, six miles a night. And that's just, you know, it's unheard. It's crazy. How much a buck will travel? So, yeah, the the does don't seem to travel that much. They kind of stay a little bit closer. They kind of, they kind of, you know, they kind of stay where you're at. Uh, is it legal to bait in Nebraska? Uh no, no. You, you have to call, if you put anything down, it's got to come out like thirty days before hunting season or or something like that. Um, they just they just made it legal here um, a few years back uh, to bait, you know, fully bait. You know, Georgia's been a non-bait station. And they've made it fully accessible to bait. Um, but I, I still don't think, you know, early season, you can get them, uh, you know, a mature buck using a bait site. But come late season, they know. You start pressuring them, putting bait out, they, they you know, they stay clear of them. So I've never shot a big buck with his nose in, in corn, so. But yeah. does draw the does. Kind of learn, don't they? <laughs> they, they learn, they've learned fast here. The first year was pretty good, but being, you know, it's been three, four years. When they finally come in, they are so nervous on pins and needles that it's just just about impossible to kill a mature buck here on core. So yeah, it's uh, uh you know, each area is a little bit different. I got one area that I hunt that's mostly field. Uh, mm. there's a, a tree line that runs along the back of the property and down one side and um you know here i finally got some some deer during the daylight mm -hmm. i catch one once in a while i catch it always at night now uh, there's mm -hmm. one area they come out they would come out half hour to an hour before shooting season shooting time mm -hmm. and you know they're just coming out there and then i finally got one spot down at, down at one corner uh, where i did catch some you know it wasn't until February, January, February, where the one day I caught them in the morning and caught them at night, you know, out right. during the daylight. And, right. Uh, you know, until then, I hadn't seen anything during the hunting season. So I'm going to have to put cameras back up, you know, getting closer to season to 
to see, you know, are they coming out during the day and where can we set our tree stands up? Yeah. Best place down right here is, uh, you know, I, st I try to stage up in between uh, bedding and feeding. Uh, I hunt the does. You hunt the does and eventually it pays off the bucks. And I don't put a lot of pressure on my deer until, you know, getting close to the rut. Um, majority of all my big deer has been killed in November. So it gets, you know, it gets really good in Georgia about November 10th on up to Thanksgiving. It gets magical here. And, you know, we have bucks show up that we've never had on camera before. No history with it or nothing. But come November, you know, they just show up. And so it's kind of, uh, you know, it just goes to show you, like, you just don't really know. If you can have trail cameras out and kill a deer right there and not actually never have on camera. So. Yeah. I mean, you know, cameras are great, you know, the, it's, it's a great tool, but, you know, there's still deer that, that dodge your camera, that go around your camera. I mean, so it's not foolproof, foolproof. No, I, I, you know, over the, the hunting season and until this last one, we pulled the cameras, I seen two, two bucks, you know, one, mm. a little bitty one and a little, little bigger one. So, you know, when I tagged them, I tagged a small buck, large buck. Well, right. come February, I caught three different bucks on there it's like it was this year's last year's and the year before's or something mm -hmm. you know all I've, I've seen three different bucks on there that one time i was i kept right. catching the other two you know quite often you know going through at night in the middle of the night you know 10 o'clock one o'clock mm -hmm. three o'clock and then in, in the night and you can't you can't hunt them because they're completely nocturnal and oh, yeah. you know we've got a few of them out there that come through during the day but uh you know not not as many as I'd like. Right. You know, the other property we have is right on the river, but where all the forest is on the other side of the river, you know, we're basically in cornfield or beans or whatever Corf. the plant. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot there. They do walk around a little bit down there. A lot of coyotes down there. So we're thinking, you know, hey, maybe we'll go some, do some coyotes, shoot some coyotes. And this other land we have, there's a lot of coyotes coming around there. So I'm kind of thinking, you know, maybe if we get rid of some of the coyotes, maybe we'll have a little more deer coming in there. <laughs> Yeah, coyotes, they, they do the same here. You know, I suburban spots in town. I, I got lots of coyotes close to town. I mean, they, they've migrated, to, you know, growing up. You know, coyotes is unheard of. But uh, now, you know, they're, you know, my suburban spots, they're, they're there. So. Yeah, you just don't see them much. No, um, I've actually, I've, I've shot two while bow hunting. But I, you know, the majority of the coyotes I see is at night time on my cameras. So. Yeah, between the coyotes and the raccoons, you know, that's yeah, what I'm catching on cameras. Yeah, raccoons are big on my corn piles. You got to be, I, I mainly run my cameras with corn piles, just do inventory, even though they're short at night, it lets me know what I've actually got. Right. So it's a good, you know, it's a good method just to see what you actually do, be able to do inventory. You know, people's like, yeah, but you're only getting nighttime pictures. I say, yes, but, I, you know, I know he's out there, you know, it's just a right. cat and mouse game. So, it's a good way to do an inventory. Yeah, so. keep track of the animals are there, you know, between the, the, the rabbits and the raccoons and coyotes and and then the deer, you know, right. so you know what's there. And sometimes you catch some weird images of, of something that you don't know what it is. And right. I had one that looked really, really ghostly because the deer would had his nose right up basically on the camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, come up, it's like it's like the sniffing the camera. It didn't care. It moseyed around for a while and then Locked off. Right. Uh, you know, the big thing here, you know, everybody's got a cell camera. So it's like a 24 hour a day, you know, scouting tool. So I love my cell cameras. Yeah, so. those, those are nice right now. Ours are just, you know, the, the the fixed ones where you go pull the SD card and you know, those are nice because you, you do get to, you know, walk around the property a little bit, but you want to make sure you don't go too often because right then you're gonna chase them out. And, Cell cameras are addictive. You wake up in the morning, look at your phone, you got like 20 or 30, uh, 50 notifications from pictures. Um, all through the day, you'd be working and get a, you know, hear the ding for the notification, look at your phone, and then there, you know, the deer you're chasing is on your corn pile at 11 o'clock in the morning. So, I mean, yeah, uh, I, I get just about, just about excited just, you know, for my cell camera and just come in and see what our guys are doing actually hunting. It's, it's addictive just running trail cameras, you know, the cell cameras up. Uh, I love it, you know, to be able to see, the, you know, 24 hours a day, eyes in the woods, so. Yeah, we we had one camera we pulled, actually a couple of them had quite a few pictures on it, but 
people when it was it was like end of december middle of december when we changed cards last mm. and heard most of the batters would be dead but a surprise they were still still running right almost a thousand pictures on on one camera mm -hmm. wind blowing blowing the branches around and constantly mm. open. there was nothing there so he's like okay we're well, gonna get rid of all those people ah okay here's a deer picture <laughs> I still run my cameras. I still got two right now. My, my couple of my good spots. Like I actually got three cameras out right now, still running. Uh, this year I'm running my cameras. Uh, you know, every day I'm not. You know, usually I pull them in, don't put them back out until like July or August. Uh, but this year I'm running them year round. So it's actually interesting. Uh, you know, I've got a camera on the scrape, and I have deers that shed their antlers, and they're still using the scrape. You know, to this date, right now. Like, oh yeah. Yeah, almost daily. They're still using it. Um, you know, I know it's a big primary, uh, you know, it's a community scrape, but I have numerous bucks still using the scrape. So that's interesting that they're still scraping, you know, they've lost their antlers or, you know, they're still they scraping. Throw new ones and yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's just like it was uh, October, November. So it's been interesting to leave the camera up, actually. Uh, first time I left the camera on, you know, the off season this early. It's been really interesting to watch the deer activity in this scrape. All the deer visiting, and you know, it's hard to tell which bucks are, are which, but you can tell a mature buck, you know, with by his body size coming yeah. here. And so, hey, I've still got a lot of deer using the scrape over. It's actually my new spot I got last year. So, where I harvest that, that 148, 141 inch nine for last year. And uh, there's two more shooters over there. Uh, so, I'm hoping. You know the many pictures of bucks i'm getting hoping it's one of the shooters that survives so but good thing about over there is uh, little deer pressure so there's a little bit of human pressure there's people that live around there but as far as hunters uh no hunters are around so it, it's really convenient for me to have a spot like that with hard yeah that's there. that's real good <laughs> so that's another thing about you know some of these suburban spots i mean you might be the only hunter in that woodlot and so it gives you an advantage of you know, they get very little pressure. And I, I'm really out of it on my deer sit. Uh, not numerous times. I try not to hunt a spot over two or three sits. So I'm real out of it uh, to make sure I don't burn a spot out. So I, I feel like you, if you start putting a lot of pressure, them big bucks know. Yeah, uh, they learn. They learn real quick. And once they learn, uh, you know, their own to you, it's, it's really tough to take. So I kind of keep my pressure alive. Our season opens in September. Um, and in Archer County, it ends January 31st. But I try not to put too much pressure until it starts cooling off. Middle into October is when I start, you know, start hunting more regularly. And then really get after November. Well, the early season, you know, when you shoot you shoot a deer, you've got to wait a little while for it to, you know, right. to bleed out. And if it's hot out, you don't have it's much hot. time. You know, it's September you, here. You it shoot it be. and kill it, and yeah. you got to get it cleaned. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I love the hunting. Uh, I just don't enjoy the heat, the bugs. Um, you know, I, was, I just don't enjoy. It. A lot of people do, but back in my younger days, it was 120 degrees. I'd be out there chasing, sweating, swatting mosquitoes. <laughs> but now that I've gotten older, I tend to enjoy it more sitting there. So I try to wait to the cold fronts or cool, you know, at least cool weather. So yeah, I, I've been out early season, you know, with the the mosquito netting on, and, and watching them walk down the the netting and so there's a hole and it bite me where the hole was yeah right <laughs> and, yeah. And, yeah that that's just no fun when you're swarmed by mosquitoes and and right. you're still getting bit through those things and they're supposed to not you know allow them to bite you but yeah they do anyway <laughs> right yeah we got a lot of mosquitoes here in georgia so you know it, stay, it tends to stay a lot warmer here i mean it doesn't really cool down until uh november so that's about when it cools down. So, yeah, with September it's pretty early and and it, it can get kind of warm. But by the time it gets you know end of September, we're normally fairly cool. Right, right. But yeah, we use that mild winters here, and so we have a high strong uh, fall survival because we have very mild winters here in Georgia. Yeah, here in Nebraska, we 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 don't. We have some pretty cold days. Right. Right. Which is a whole new challenge when, when you're out there when it's really cold, your equipment's cold, you're cold, and you know, they seem like they, they pull harder, like right. a little stiffer. 
and right. kind of what how you lubed your your axles uh they may be binding up a little bit because whatever you use is cold uh, right and then your muscles are cold and right yeah but luckily we have really mild winters here so it's a good thing to, um, you know be a bow only because you don't have to layer as much you know that'd be a challenge to me having to hunt somewhere where it's very 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 very, very cold uh, that, that seems like a, a challenge of itself to be able to bow hunt yeah yeah we'll we'll put on some some thermal underwear and you know and heavy coats and jackets and bibs and um you know get out there and you know right. and try and stay warm and you know you get warm enough and you have the great big you know um big boots you use for like arctic weather you know minus 60 below boots i got yeah. it, it looks like bigfoot you know i i can't walk in them because they're just, they're so big and and my feet get so hot uh, i can actually be sweating in them and still stay warm because there's right. insulation. So I will generally walk in with my other boots and pull them off and put those on instead. Uh, yeah. If it's going to be that cold. Uh, otherwise, I got some of those um, the Arctic Shield boot covers that I put over my boots. Yeah. Those work pretty. It gets a little bit of insulation. It's not as good as the, you know, the, the ones designed to be up in Alaska, you know, minus six, mm -hmm. but it's still, you know, much better than, uh, you know, not having anything on there. Right. Right. Yeah, whole whole new challenges. Every every area has their own challenge. <laughs> right. Luckily, I'm, I've I barely grew up just bow hunting in Georgia, so um, I've just never had a desire to go out west or anywhere. I enjoy the whole, you know, the scouting, uh, the preseason, the homework, and everything that goes uh, into it. So I actually enjoy, you know, hunting around where I live. So. It, and you know some people like to travel all over the the country and all over the world doing hunts and you know i have i've been to canada moose hunting and you know down at, you know it was, it was rifle i want to do archery but it was rifle season when buddy of mine booked the calls or the trip right. uh, i've been down with him he you know every year he goes on different hunt and i went down to a, a hog hunt hog and mm -hmm. hunting hunt in, in south part of texas you know one year and um i took my bow uh, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, they didn't get the message that they have an archer here wants to shoot him with his bow. So they mm -hmm. signed up in a rifle stand. And the last day, I went ahead and used his rifle to shoot one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm standing in the doorway, basically, to shoot because you can't shoot through the windows. Correct. You, you Correct. know, they're, they're just not situated for an archer. And so I'm yeah, archer, the best archer, standing in a doorway. <laughs> yeah, archery takes a, a different skill set, uh, you know setting up i mean it, it's just it's just totally different i mean i know a lot of guys do both i just once i went archery home in, i think 2001 um i, I have a deer hunt with the gun since 2001 i've been archery only so once i picked it up and took it i, I just stayed there i have no desire to harvest anything with a gun anymore yeah it's you know and and some of us that's how we do it and others you know we do archery we do gun we do you know whatever season it is you know take advantage of it and right Fortunately, now here in Nebraska, they changed it where it doesn't shut down during our firearm season. Mm -hmm. It continues. The only difference mm -hmm. is during those nine days of rifle, we have to wear orange. Right. Where the rest of time, we don't have to. Um, so in our archery counties, we don't have to wear any orange, but if we bow hunt during gun season in a gun county, we have to wear orange. So basically the same thing. Yeah. Well, in that way, because they can't see you. Right. You know, you, you disappear and they won't know you're there. And I can, right. you know, Deer can't see the orange. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. I mean, um, that's what they say. Yeah, they can see ultraviolet. So anything right. shines up on a black light, they can see. Correct. So that's what they can shine a black light over. If it glows, yeah, it's a good chance that it's going to glow to see. the deer as well. Right. Correct. Yeah, you know, that's why I don't worry about you know being, having camo arrows. Uh, I figure if the deer can tell I don't have camo and arrows, I'm already busted. <laughs> You're already busted. The yeah, biggest yeah. defense, the biggest defense, I think, uh, hunters have is, is their their sense of smell. Right. If you can fool that, you can fool them. So, I'm real particular on my on my scent control. Well, and I do that. You know, I wash with the 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 scent eliminating soap and and shampoos, and and then I have. Uh, um, you know the chart one of the charcoal suits i think it's scent blocker scent lock 
Mm. I forget now. I started out with a British chem suit. Yeah. Activated charcoal it just does the same thing. And, and I wear those. And, uh, you know, so I don't worry about the wind as much because I've gone through all that. To, you eliminate my scent from going out there. Um, but, you know, if you can work on the, the scent. Everything and, else. And, and the wind, you know, it's always nice to have the wind. Because if you do make a noise, it's a little easier for them to not hear it. Correct. You know, if you're downwind of them. Uh, Correct. You know, but it's just all a, depending on the area you're in. Uh, when I hunt um, one of the wildlife areas, when I was hunting it all the time, uh, you know, a lot of campers and there's always people there. Mm -hmm. You know, so little human scent, they they don't care about it because they're they're smelling humans all the time. Correct. Right. And so they're they're not as sensitive to scents like that. Uh, so you can get by it a little bit, but you know, the one area that uh, they didn't use to have hunting, one of the forests is here down by the river, um, they didn't have hunting and they started picking up hunting. Everybody said, Well, it's just gonna you're just gonna pick one and shoot them. Day one, yes, day two, no. They figured out in one day that they're being hunted. So then they, yeah. they had no advantage the second day. Uh, right. They knew they were being hunted, and you had to hunt them like any other deer. <laughs> Once they catch them, they catch them. They catch them really fast. Right. Yeah, and that you know, they I seen pictures of like in the '60s and '70s where looking in the forest, you could not see more than about five feet. It was just yeah. so thick. And when they started doing the hunting, you couldn't you couldn't see any cover below the height the deer could get to. You could see for a long ways you know 100 yards was not not hard to see because anything that they could eat they ate you know so you could walk through the forest and there was no leaves at your head level because they could stand up and pull the leaves off pull and, down browse and and the people around there around there that lived there in their houses they couldn't grow much for crops because the deer would eat them couldn't have roses because they'd eat the roses you know pretty much everything that they could eat they would eat and, right and then you'd have people say, well, I feed them. Yeah, well, the only problem is you feed that that doe, and the next thing you hear, she has two fawns instead of one. And now you got to feed three of them the next year. And then all those does have more. So they multiply. Yes. Yeah. And, and when I'm, I've gathered anyway, about two tons of food a, a year is what a deer eats. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to feed one deer, how much are you going to supply to them? <laughs> A lot. Yeah, a lot. Yes. Sir. So, you know, it's it's not always a good deal to to feed them. Um, you know, if you feed them all the time, they're going to get used to it. And they're going to come in. Mm -hmm. You know, I know other guys that, you know, the guys that hunt, but he's got where he's at. He he puts feed out for the deer. And I can see, you know, January, February, but there's no nothing growing, especially if they have, you know, a lot of snow on the ground. You know, get mm -hmm. a supplement uh, out there and feed them during that time. Uh, but once the things start growing, they got plenty of food to eat. So tell us about your most difficult hunt. Um, one of my most difficult hunts uh, was probably the deer that uh, is actually my largest deer, but it, it brought back a lot of memories because um, my son was always my hunting partner. And he went off to college. So I was missing my hunting partner. And he went off to Georgia Southern. And I got this deer to show up on camera in the area that I was hunting. And I looked at it. I said, I've never seen this deer before. And he looked so big on camera. It almost looked like it was, you know, the camera delusion or, you know. Yeah. It looked delu you know, delusional. And so I. I got pictures of them one afternoon or Wednesday. And the spot that I had, I seen numerous deer. I said, I see a lot of deer. So I said, I'm going to wait. Uh, we got a, we had a cold front coming in, high pressure cold front on Saturday. And the Saturday morning was going to be down in the 20s. And I, I decided to wait to go hunting. So I went there Saturday morning, and uh, I've never not seen a deer at this spot. Climbed up Saturday morning, and I hunted till noon and did not see a deer. So discouraged because I've had pictures of two shooter bucks and a deer call halls, and I had him show up, and I had no history with him, none. So I said I decided to move my stand uh, closer to a thicket 
uh, about four yards away. So that afternoon, I climbed up. Sure enough, right at about 520, the spot that I was at, the big deer is 16 pointers, eight by eight. He showed up 10 yards from the tree, I hunted that morning. <laughs> so my move was not a good move. So I'm standing there, and my first instinct was, I'm going to get my, my camera out on my phone to take a picture of because nobody's going to believe me. But then I sat back down and said, I'm going to hit my grunt call a few times. If I hit my grunt call two times, and like I was straight, he just walked 30 yards from me, stop rod side, and I made a perfect shot of him. You know, the first thing I did was I shot him, I called my son, or son down at George Southern, and I said, you ain't, you're not going to believe what I just did. I just shot the biggest deer of my life. And it kind of bothered me because, you know, he wasn't there to share it with me. And so I called a couple more of my good buddies up that I hunted with, and they, they come and help me track in a short track job. And when I laid my hands on him, I've never laid hands on a deer. It's large before. And Georgia, we got some really good deer, but, you know, 175-inch net, you know, buck, you know, eight by eight, they're very far few between. And he was non-typical. So that's my largest deer and probably my favorite deer. But I've killed a lot of other deer that's that I find it hard for. Uh, deer I shot last year, me and him played cat and mouse for two weeks. He'd show up, either win me, no, I wasn't there. So I finally had to change tactics and move down closer to his bed area. And I've never really hunted out of a ground blind. So I actually uh, harvested him out of a ground blind. And that was a true challenge, being eye level with all the deer. I mean, they were just so many eyes. There, it was just hardest thing. When he, when he showed up, I actually laid down in the ground blind and was waiting until he got within range for me to kneel up, take a shot at it. But this that was last year. So, yeah, ground blinds are a little different to shoot out of, aren't they? Yes, yes. Um, actually, I like ground blinds, but I would rather have up a climber or a, uh, a lock up, preferably. But there was no trees to climb where the steer was showing up regularly, and I had to make a move on it. And a ground blind was the only, the only way. So that was it. Yeah, I've hunted out of ground blinds. It's kind of nice up here, you know, in Nebraska in the wintertime because you don't need to have so much clothes on. Right. And, you also use a heater. You yeah. Also use a heater. yeah. So, yeah, it, it's comfortable. But fooling those big deer and having deer eye level with you in the range is really tough really tough so yeah I, I like the visibility that i have you know being up in a tree stand i still prefer I a tree stand I did too. Because, you know i can see you know you're a little bit more exposed you have to deal with the wind a little bit more a little bit more and, and nebraska probably the only time you don't have wind is first thing in the morning i don't right. know you got wind all day long all and, day. you know we can have 20 30 mile an hour winds and you can't bow hunt in that kind of wind <laughs> no no but you know, I like to pick my weather, but sometimes you don't have no choice because um, you can't kill from the couch, uh, you know, but. No. So. Yeah, I had, I had one time I was, it was, it was, you know, light rain, supposed to be light raining and uh, guys hunting with, he, he wanted to go hunting. It's like, I really don't go, you know, it's, it's all rainy and it's hard to track them. But I knew if I didn't go, he'd sit in my tree stand and hit you to deer. <laughs> So you went. So I went and I shot a deer out on my tree stand. Majority and, of my hunts, uh, I hunt my son. So majority of all my hunts, I'm hunting my oldest son. I mean, he, he's a big bow hunter too. His passion is just like mine in bow hunting. And, you know, luckily he, he likes to go. So he's hard to get up in the morning, but once I get him up and going, he, he's going. <laughs> yeah. Hard to get up in the morning. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Yeah, it's it hunting in the rain is a whole new new experience in, in it because you don't have much of blood trap. No. Yeah. I tend not to hunt the rain much. Uh this rain and I just I just I tend not to do it just for that reason is recovery. Uh if you don't see them fall right there, it's just it's almost impossible unless you if a marginal hit. So yeah, unfortunately I was able to track the footprints. Right. The mud. Because there wasn't much blood. Right. It yeah, didn't watch go very far, but you know, it tracking it in the mud and you don't hear them crash because right. it's wet. And yeah, it's a it's it's a little different hunt when you're hunting in the rain. I prefer not to. A light mist. I know we went out one time and it was supposed to stop raining, you know, about time shooting time starts. So I figured, okay, it's not gonna be raining. We go out there, 
it didn't stop raining. Well, okay, well, let's wait a little bit longer. It didn't stop raining. So now we're about three hours into the hunt and it's still raining. So we decide to leave. And uh, my son is fairly close to me and we're walking out. And here, what do we see in front of us? About 20 yards or so. A deer mm. standing broadside to us. So right. my son is like, okay, stand behind me, get ready. Because you can load your arrow because we didn't have any arrows knocked. And I was like, I'm going right. to stand here because he's going to be looking at me. He's not going to see you behind me. Get ready and step out. And, and of course, it did mosey off before he got ready. But, you know, that was, that would have been fun. <laughs> right. You know, because then all he do is he just kind of lean out and take a shot and. <laughs> right. You know, I could slowly squat down or something, or he could just kind of step to the side. And <laughs> I don't think I'd want to squat down because that lower limb might smack me in the back of the head or something, you know. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> he could easily step off to the side and 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 take a shot, but yeah, it didn't pan out. Hey, it, didn't pan out. it goes. <laughs> I think yeah, I haven't hover speed you off the ground either. Uh, I say uh actually one, one really good one that that's all I've ever harvested off the ground. I've shot two does off the ground. As far as anything mature, only one. Only one spot in stall. So majority of all of our deer, we know is that tree stands or ground ones. Yeah, most of mine have all been tree stands. Um, I don't think I ever shot one out of a blind because the couple times I did use a blind, I didn't get anything coming by. But I've shot quite a few out of a tree stand. And right. That's the yeah, Jordan, I, have I just prefer it. You know, you're up there. I can see them coming in. I can see behind me instead of look, trying to, you know, look through the few spots that you have open that you can see out of your blind. And, you know, if you have them open, then they can see you moving inside. and uh, of course, if you're moving, we're up in tree stand. are going to see you anyway, right? <laughs> but I can I can easily you know, turn my head slowly to the side and look, as opposed to you know trying to move around and to find a hole to work out look out of them. I just prefer them. You know, a lot of people like them. You know, there's I've talked to a few people on on here that have uh, you know, they prefer on the ground. They set up kind of natural natural blinds, and you know they tuck away and. Um, well, guys tell me it's like if you put up a ground blind, they know it immediately and stay away. They'll see right. it 100 yards away and avoid you. So you got to use natural stuff. And, you know, and if you're using like your traditional equipment, now they're so long, you know, right. don't worry about how tall it is. And, you know, I've I've okay. taken one time and I shot, I was shooting down and sitting down and, and my lower limb hit the tree stand. And of course, yes. yeah, I'm not even close to hitting it. It's like, this yeah. is an easy shot, but my limb hit the bottom. Found the I've done that one time. So I know you heard a lot of power. I'm looking around, the deer's still staring at me. So I've had that happen to me one time. Yeah, just one time. I've had the string hit one time. I knew yeah. better. I had the string hit my arm, you know, in the wintertime with big heavy coat on and, mm. you know, end up making, you know, still a killing shot, but end up being, you know, shattered the, the thigh bone mm. or leg bone. Uh, the broadhead just completely shattered it and, of course, took out a main artery. So it bled out anyway. Bled it, it went and laid down. I could see it, but there was a big tree in the So I couldn't put another arrow in it because I couldn't get to the spot doing it good. Right. Yeah, you because know, I always figure, you know, hey, if it's in range, I already got one arrow in it. I'm going to stick another one in it. You know, just, you know, a second arrow. Yeah, a little interest never never hurts. Uh, yeah, I shoot, I shoot a deer. I don't see him go down, and he does down, or I get another shot. I put another one in. So, yeah, I had one I shot that was coming. It was probably five yard shot. Mm -hmm. I shot it before it could walk underneath my tree stand. It run out in the field about thirty yards. Stood broadside, and uh, of course, I'm now I have to lean out to get around a tree, and I'm using my safety belt to hold me into the tree stand. And mm. take another shot, and I made a good shot on it. It may have just stood there and fell over, but it run to the top of the hill, and and it kind of took a right turn into a bunch of brush, and was there it was laying in the brush. You know, a couple hours later, we finally find it. It's like okay, it's nowhere. We don't see any more blood, and then we found it. And you know, early season, so you don't have a lot of time. <laughs> That's one good thing about archery, taught me. Um, it teaches you to be a really good trapper. You know, right. <laughs> You learn, you learn so much more from being an archery hunter than you do gun hunting. But it, 
you know, it teaches you patience, uh, getting close to your quarters of your game, uh, tracking skills. So it makes you all around better hunter. Yeah, because, you know, you, you have to track them, you know, like a lot of times the rifle, they don't run very far. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they do. You, you never you never know. Um, but, yeah, they don't normally lay down real, within sight. Sometimes they do. Um, you know, even on a bad hit, they're going to run, you know, 20, 30 yards. Sometimes they're going to go lay down and, you know, and then if it's not a good hit, you got how long you got to wait before you can go out and get them. <laughs> right. Right, right. Well, yeah, I, I can see you're at work, so we don't want to take up too much of your day. Um, okay. Tell us about um, your most exciting hunt. Most exciting. Um it's hard to just pick just one because with archery equipment, they're all exciting. Right. <laughs> it's, you know. Or maybe what's the most memorable hunt that you had? Most memorable hunt? Um, I would say it's a deer that me and my son were chasing. And uh, it was one morning. It was one of those bashful mornings. And we're both like 60 yards away. And it was nonstop buck chasing. They were chasing those to him, chasing those to me. He was couldn't get a shot. I couldn't get a shot. I mean, they were chasing deer circles. And I finally got a shot. My son being there, I shot a really big deer and just having him there. And uh, you know, seeing that much running activity was just it was so insane that the running activity that morning that there were seven, eight, nine mature bucks chasing the same three does. It's all right. They would they did the circles around. They would leave 10 minutes later, they're coming back grunting, raising cane. I mean, it was, by the time I got a shot, I was so tore up. I don't know how I composed myself to make a 20 yard <laughs> shot. It was just, it was a chip shot, but I was so torn up from the drooling and buck fever that it was really tough. That's probably my most memorable. Yeah, th those are as exciting ones when you, when you have all that activity going on. That's the best running morning I've ever experienced in my life. So. Yeah, that, that would be quite a memorable hunt i mean you couldn't even sit down it was it was so you know hot that morning i mean you just got to sit back down and here they come again you hear them grunting and running you know so it was it was one of those magical mornings yeah well um what would you say to um our audience you know what would you like to tell them you know whether it be a beginning archer or a median or advanced archer um what would you like to say to them? And to all the beginners out there, remember us good, you know, us guys been doing it, did it successful. We were right there where you was at one time. We were once beginners. And if, if it's your passion, you know, follow it. Um, you know, bow hunting has got so many ups and downs, challenges, but the rewards are so great that uh, you know, the biggest thing with, with archery is is practice. Practice, practice, practice. Know your equipment, learn your equipment, and just stay at it. Because eventually, you know, it, it's the dots are going to line up, and you'll be successful. I would rather shoot a hundred inch deer with my bow than a hundred eighty inch deer with my gun. To be honest with you. So, yeah, a little more challenging. A lot more challenges, a lot more satisfaction. And, you know, just some of the archery hunting uh, that stuck with me. Uh, when it, once I started, I, I haven't stopped. It's been a passion, something that drives me year round, drives me something I, I never go daily without thinking about. So, and yeah, archery's not cheap. So, make sure you beginners get a good job to pay for it because archery's not cheap. Well, and, and then when you look at, you know, what's the price per pound for the deer that you get, you know, the, the amount we're spending to get that few you know, the one deer, two deer, however many you get, you know, there's, there's a lot invested in it. Everybody thinks, you know, oh, it's, it's cheap. Well, yeah, our ammo is fairly cheap because we can reuse it. Unlike right. you shoot it once, you can reuse the brass. That's it. Everything else is expendable. And, <laughs> you know, being a reloader, I know that very well. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's just so much you know, there's a lot of fun doing it and there's a little more challenge in it. And, and it's just, I enjoy the off season, the practices, the scouting, you know, the running cameras. There's so much more goes into bow hunting. Um, I really enjoy getting my yard after you know, practicing. 
that's something I've always enjoyed. Is, you know, staying in tune, messing with archery equipment. I do my own boat work, and do my own boat tune, and uh, you know, it's kind of something I've got. All, I, I'm fully set up, you know, to do all my all my own archery work. I build my own arrows, so it's really yeah. I I've, I've been I've been making my own arrows well since the the sixties when I started. You know, I've got some arrows I I made. And they're they're wooden shafts, but the tips were actually crimped on, and mm -hmm. you, have, you have to glue the knock on and, and fletch them. And uh, when I started out, my first very first fletching jig cost me a dollar sixty five. I started out. I remember shooting twenty one seventeen game getters with yeah. five inch feathers with a PSC Jet Flight Express with five inch overdraw. Shooting fingers add that. Yeah, and then when I got a mechanical release, I was like, "Oh my goodness, with a trigger and a P, I didn't, yeah, you know, cheap one pin with fingers. That's how I started out. Yeah, I started off with fingers as well. I didn't start with the PSE, but I eventually worked the PSE, and um, and in two thousand one, I I become a PSE dealer, and mm -hmm. you know, I've got a couple of PSEs that I shoot, and uh, and then when I was working at Cabela's. I managed to get one of their returns because there's problems yeah. with it. At a real cheap, it was like a nine hundred dollar bear uh, in the snow camo, and I forget what I paid for it, but yeah, I, it was it was really cheap. And but it needed a new string, uh, no big deal. I have the string. I've been making strings since I had my store. Mm. Uh, so I've been making twenty years ago. I started making strings, and um, then I had to do some other work on a couple of things. There was you know the strings stop was messed up i had to fix that so i fixed that and and you know it's all back working but i've never shot it because i've never finished setting it up <laughs> yeah i don't need three bows to set up i still got my hunting bow i need to fix i got right. my trigger bow i need to fix and uh you know i was using the target one to go through a whole series of how to work on bows and i got so far i got so many things going on it's like i can get back to that finish up that bow get it working i got it I put a new string on my hunt bow, so I need to get it set up. And right, yeah, there's just so many things to do, and but it's fun. I enjoy doing it, and I enjoy creating the videos on on doing some of that stuff as well. And so, Thank, yeah. well, thanks for having me. I really yeah. enjoyed. It. Yeah, it was, it's been a lot of fun, and and you know, one thing for you new archers or even experienced archers. The uh, you know the podcast Arch Talk One Hundred and One, and I have a Facebook group of the same name, and in there you know it, we there to help beginners shoot. So hey, if you if you have a setup that you're not sure of, you know take pictures of it, upload it, and there's people who have been working on bows for for decades. You know I I've been working on bows since well two thousand one, been arch instructor since ninety five. Uh, so upload an image of your form. And it, it's all for for helping you learn. And I always tell you know everybody, it's like the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. Correct. Yeah, you know, and, and and that's what it is. You know, ask you know, and you'll you'll get you know honest answers. You know, I've seen some groups. The answer is like, well, how's my form? You just need to shoot bigger, more. And I'm like, well, shooting wrong isn't going to help you. Let's let's figure out what your problem is, and and then make you better archer. And and that's that's what we're doing is make you know trying to make everybody is you know better archery and you know the the podcast that you know I, I started out with you know a lot of information now and doing a lot of interviews it's just so fun talking to the archers all over the world you know like, like you down in Georgia and uh, in foreign countries and you know all over it, it just all the, the same same thing you're all here to help each other out so if there's anything you have any questions on hey you know if you're in the group Post a comment, you know, we'll help you out. If you're not, if you're listening to this on the, the podcast, you can always make a, a post there. Or if you actually get to watch it on the YouTube channel, hey, make comments. You know, I do read them and, you know, here to help. So, Jeremy, it's been great talking to you. And I'm Thank sure you've got to get back to uh, uh, back. Yes, to unfortunately. Kind of take them out of your day here. <laughs> no problem. And thanks for having me. And uh, what I'll do is I'll put a link in the description, you know, how to okay. contact you. Um, and that way, anybody in Georgia that needs something done, hey, we yeah, have to, you to somebody that uh, knows what they're doing and can help you out and you know, help a fellow archer out. 
Trust me, I will. Who is this? <laughs> and who knows? You you might find your next best friend. <laughs> right. All right. Well, thank you, Roy. Yep. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Roy Canterbury, and I've been your host today on Arch Talk 101.